Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Circular Economy webinar. Today we've got uh, Heloise Buckland, who's the CEO and founder of Husk, which is a fantastic com company that makes uh, fertilizer for the most uh, disadvantaged and at risk folks around Southeast Asia and the region. Um, Heloise has got a very interesting background with over 20 years' experience working for organizations like the Inter American Development Bank and UNDP. And um, she's an all around good guy, good person, you know, doing the right thing. So I'm very, we're very happy to have her here. Uh, given that we have some significant problems with fertilizer coming our way in 2023 and 2024. So this is a very timely uh, webinar. So Heloise, I'll hand over to you. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for inviting me and inviting Husk. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here and share, share our story. I am just going to share some slides. So do give me a thumbs up when we can, when we can see that correctly. Is that, are we seeing that correctly? Yeah, I'm, I'm assuming that's okay. So Husk is a mission-driven company and we are in the business of supporting smallholder farmers as we feel those are the most vulnerable faced with uh, the threats of climate change. And we transform rice husk into biochar products to regenerate soils and sequester carbon and improve lives. And what I'm gonna to do today is, is three things. First, talk about the challenges of why husk, why we are in the business of soil regeneration and uh, carbon sequestration. Uh, then I'll explain a little bit about our solution, our circular economy solution that we have pioneered and um, proven in Cambodia. And thirdly, I will tell you something about our ambitions to scale and would love to then hear from you your questions of, of how we can scale up circular economy solutions in Southeast Asia and Asia more widely. So just in the time of those 15 seconds that I've given that introduction, we have lost three football pitches of soil across the world. So this is the um, FAO in 2015 had a big push on soils. And we're now at the stage where one third of the planet has degraded soil. When I say degraded soil, I mean pretty much what you can see on this sort of football sized pitch um, that we just lost um, in these 15 seconds. Uh, we're talking about lack of topsoil, so lack of organic matter. I mean, I don't know how many of you have gardens on your balconies over there, but I'm sure you appreciate that it's very challenging to grow food when there is when there's soil so barren as this. Um, but it's not just food security that is challenging. The soil provides um, a host of other ecosystem services, including water filtration, um, protecting our rivers, our waterways from runoff from any chemicals or other pollutants that, that hit the soil, um, and a series of health implications and environmental um, implications of, of that, as, as you can imagine. So we're in a, we're in a pretty serious state. Um, from Spain, where we founded our husk, we actually have 29% of, of degraded land and now de desert land. By 2050, that will be 50%. So you can see in this map um, the areas around the world that have de degraded soil, and in some of them that is really challenging. Obviously, there's human implication to this in terms of we often talk about climate refugees, but at some point I think we'll have to talk about soil refugees because um, this is, you know, this is what, what we depend on for, for survival. So oh, I'm sorry, my... And, and one of the reasons um, behind this, I hope you can, apologies, I hope you can see this, this slide correctly. But one of the reasons behind this soil degradation is the intense agriculture that, that the world has been experiencing over the last um, 70 years, really. And in these two graphs, you can see the nitrogen and phosphorus consumption, two of the, of the main elements that the soils do need and plants do need for life. But you can see how much has been applied and how that's been increasing over time. And the issue here that you can see in the orange, this is Asia. So Asia probably has, has the Asian soils have received more nitrogen and phosphorus than any other global region over the last 70 years. 
And this has depleted the organic matter because of this intensive application of, of these synthetic fertilizers. There has been um, an erosion and a degradation of the of the organic matter behind that. And um, this has been this has uh, largely predominantly been um, to create to grow more food, um, which which obviously is highly necessary. But the implications of, of depleting organic matter means in the long term. Um, soils and farmers become more dependent on external inputs. And why is that so critical now? Well, obviously, with with the um, the increase in fertilizer prices, this becomes a major challenge. And and I'm sure this is, you know, in part why you've invited me to this to this webinar series. You know, we're really at critical points as if climate change, soil degradation um, was not enough. We've now got uh, an addition to the global food crisis, which is that where 50% of our sunflower oil and 30% of our global wheat production from Russia and Ukraine come from is also under threat. Um, and so the, the challenges are just, are just kind of insurmountable. Uh, add, add to this uh, the increasing oil price and the, the fragility of the shipping system, and we are really in a, in a state of, of crisis in terms of our soils. So the fertilizer prices, as you know, have increased by 30% uh, just this year. And that's on top of the 80% increase uh, towards the end of last year. So we're hitting um, the prices that we had around 2008 in the in the um, in the economic crisis there in, at that period. And as well as the high prices, there's also a massive instability in terms of supply chains. Um, and this is you know an additional threat to those smallholder farmers who actually do um, grow 80% of food in Asia. And, and are the most threatened by the other challenges which are ongoing, the increasing in temperatures, the increasing instability. So um, apologies for the bad news, but I just wanted to really kind of lay the land of, of the context of this challenge. And, and as you know, and as I'm sure all of you are working towards um, supporting those most vulnerable, the smallholder farmers who grow around 80% of the food in, the, in Asia uh, are the ones that are, that are most threatened. Um, an additional problem that we're seeing in, in Cambodia, as you'll see the age of, of this um, rice farmer here, is also the lack of labor. So in addition to these challenges, we have urban migration. So obviously most of the poverty in Asia is in the rural areas in Cambodia, 90% of those under the poverty line live in rural areas. And, and they are getting older because uh, the younger generations don't want to be um, farmers anymore, particularly rice, which is, which is of deep concern given that it's a staple food for over half of the world's population. So young people are fleeing to the cities and this means there's a lack of, lack of labor. Uh, so again, this is probably why uh, most farmers will, will go for the synthetic fertilizer option because it's, um, it's easy to apply and requires less labor. However, in the absence of the, um, of the availability of that, we're having to go backwards to, to using local resources such as cow manures and dams and so on, which is very challenging when you're, when you're short of hands. So that is, that is the context, that is the challenge that, that we face. And, and now I'm going to talk about the solution. So there is, um, we can kind of stop getting being so depressed. I'm just gonna take a sip of coffee. So at Husk, we've developed a circular economy solution by transforming one of the um, world's largest sources of biomass um, by volume, which is rice husk, into biochar, which is um, a soil improver. And when we bind this with other, other nutrients, it becomes also a fertilizer. So the reason that we have chosen rice husk um, as a feedstock is because 150 million tons of rice husk are produced every year across the world. After wheat and corn, rice is the largest crop by volume in the world. And 25% of the volume of the paddy that comes off the field is rice husk. And this is what it looks like. Um, so myself and co-founder Carol, when we set up um, husk uh, three years ago, we came across, we looked at all sorts of different agricultural residues. And we thought if, if the smallholder farmers are the ones most challenged by climate change, yet they're the ones presumably with access to, to biomass. And there are lots of very um, exciting ways we can add value to biomass. Uh, so, so why not rice husk? 
Um, and when we came across Rice Husk, we, we researched um, with all of a series of global experts around the world of what can we transform this rice husk into to improve the livelihoods of these smallholder farmers. And we looked at uh, building materials, we looked at um, in, even making chopsticks from rice husk, uh, biodegradable spoons and, and all, sorts of, um, all sorts of activities, silica for, for chips. However, what we, um, what we didn't do, and this was, I think, my, my most humbling experience as an entrepreneur, is we didn't ask the smallholder farmers, what do you do with the rice husk? And actually, when we, um, when we discovered from a, from a consultant that we could turn the rice husk into biochar, we then, we then discovered that this is something that, that farmers have been doing for years, for thousands of years, is taking a pile of rice husk, um, putting a metal tube in it, and cooking the husk to turn it into a carbon rich um, matter, which we now know as biochar. And then adding this to the soil to, in the, in the words of the first person I spoke to, the first farmer I spoke to about this, to make soil soft. So I'm sure you're all familiar with hard clay soils, particularly in dry arid regions or dry arid periods of the year, impossible to, to have anything germinate in those soils. And the rice husk uh, biochar makes these soils soft. It does other things, which I'll explain, but. The interesting thing here is that rice farmers um, have been making biochar for years. And um, however, this, this ancient agricultural practice has been lost because no longer do we have the access to the, to the biomass in small village mills. What happens now through industrialization is that the rice has piles up at the, at the rice mill. This is our site, um, our second production site in Cambodia, and this is Amru Organic Rice Mill, one of the second largest mills in Cambodia. And our installation is literally just on the other side of this fence. So because the farmers don't have access to the husk because it piles up in, in a centralized location, what they ended up doing was buying synthetic fertilizers um, and then further degrading their soil. And, we, and we, we've, I've already talked through the implications of that. So our solution is to take an age, age old agricultural practice and using world-class pyrolysis technology and some finance um, get this practice back up to scale um, because it's 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 really returning something that makes a lot of sense. In the rest of the world, biochar has been also around for, for many years, and the first remains of biochar are from 3,000 years ago in the Amazon, um, terra preta, which means black soil in in Portuguese, um, is a practice that is that is also common in in other parts of the world. And, and so we're really recovering something which is, which is not, uh, not new. And this is key when you're selling a product as we're not in the business of behavior change. We're not encouraging farmers to do something crazy different. We're actually just saying, look, you know about biochar, um, but here you have it in a bag ready to go. And also with added nutrients, so it's even easier and requires less labor to apply. I think that's very key when you're innovating any new business is, is to ensure that you're not um, having to change behaviors is very hard work. Um, and so this, this product has to make sense uh, financially and in terms of impact. So, uh, so this, is, this is a close up. We turn the rice husk into biochar. Um, and as you can see, the rice husk is already in nice small pieces. Uh, so we don't have to pre-grind or pre-crush. So that limits our, our processing costs. And, and we don't have to crush or, or do anything with it once, once, we, once we've made the biochar. So that's, um, that's an advantage um, of using this feedstock. So here we have the circular economy solution, if you like. In terms of carbon, um, I'll just touch on the carbon story is very relevant. So the rice plant, like any plant, as you know, um, absorbs the CO2. When the paddy is taken to the mill and here the husk is separated from the grain, this is where we intervene with pyrolysis technology, which is a way of heating the, the husk uh, to high temperatures between 550 and 650 degrees centigrade in the absence of oxygen. So it's an oxygen starved um, environment. And that means that we don't create CO2. So we avoid the CO2 emissions going back into the atmosphere. In most uh, rice mills, the, about 60% of the rice is not used for paddy drying. 40% will be used internally to dry paddy. So that's a, a good source of uh, renewable energy, if you like, whereas 60% is not used and tends to be burnt um, for fuel. In the case of Cambodia, it's burnt as a cheap fuel for the brick industry or the cement industry. 
at high temperatures in the presence of oxygen. And that causes not only CO2, but other, uh, but silicon dioxide, which is, which is very harmful to human health, causing silicates. And in other countries, it can be turned into pellets uh, and, and also burnt at high temperatures, which over 700 degrees, when you burn the rice husk, given it's 90% silica, you do produce these, these to toxic um, silicates. So we avoid those emissions. We don't burn the husk. So we're avoiding the emissions and we turn the, uh, the carbonized rice husk into biochar products, which we then sell through our distribution channels to farmers who end up putting the carbon in the soil. And according to the IPCC, the uh, carbon stays in the soil for um, 100 years. So this is obviously terrible for business because we have a product that doesn't need to be replaced. Um, however, it's very good for the soil and it's very good for the farmers. So it's, it's an, and they can add a small amount year by year or cycle by cycle, which adds to building up this organic matter, which unfortunately um, we, we're continuing to lose as I speak. So these are the products that we have created and we operate in Cambodia. So we registered our company in 2019 as a private company, a subsidiary of our, of our company in Spain. And all of these products are registered with the Ministry of Agriculture, which recognizes them within the category of fertilizers. So we've got biochar, which is 100% organic biochar, which, which has the function of regenerating the soils because biochar I perhaps should explain a little bit in more detail for those of you who have not heard of it before, um, it acts as a sponge in the soil. So it has three main functions because of its high porosity. So we have almost 200 meters squared for every gram of surface area. So if you took a, a teaspoon of biochar and um, spread out the surface of that teaspoon of biochar in terms of all the little pores and the edges, uh, you would you would cover 200 meters squared. So that surface area, i.e. the high porosity of the biochar, means that it will retain water very effectively, which is hugely important in, dra in dr drought, uh, dry seasons, and, and also implies a 50% reduction in water use, given that the, the soil's hold, water holding capacity is increased. But it also holds nutrients. So this means that those, um, the NPK, the nitrogen, phosphor phosphorus, and potassium that that the plants need and that it tend to be added from synthetic fertilizers uh, can also be held on and you can improve the fertilizer efficiency again by up to 50%. And the third um, thing that the biochar holds onto is the microorganisms. So um, biochar has been described as a hotel for microorganisms because of all of these, uh, this high porosity, the fungi, the bacteria, and the, uh, the algae and the other microorganisms um, can, can remain in the soil. And I actually, I went to a conference on soil last week in, um, in Provence and Jane Goodall, the famous conservationist gave us a talk there and it was very interesting. And she said that in every teaspoon of healthy living soil, we have more microorganisms than there are people living on the planet. So these microorganisms are highly, highly important for the functioning of, um, of plant growth from transporting the nutrients from, from the soil to the, to the roots. And, and it's far more complex than we, than we could ever understand. So those microorganisms really need a home. They need a hotel, they need somewhere to live. And if your soil is barren and arid and has no structure, that is impossible to, to gain that diversity. So that, that is the biochar. Um, we then, uh, in our first year of, of making biochar, we were sold out um, every month because as I mentioned before, the farmers know about this, but they don't have access to it. And the biochar that we make is a, of a higher quality than the, than the ashy biochar that, um, that, that, was, that was made previously because it, it is not, not such a quality environment. The second product is carbon-based fertilizer. So we've mixed the biochar with other nutrients, including compost and other uh, byproducts from the rice industry. And this is used as a seedling mix. So very effective for cacao, pepper, coffee, and all sorts of fruit and nut trees, particularly at the seedling stage when um, they can be very fragile and when there is a lot of uh, a high rate of die off um, if you don't have the, the proper um, substrate. And the third product, which we have, and so we've also been sold out of this product um, and we continue to be sold out of, of, of the carbon-based fertilizer. And we've now created a third product launched just last week, 
onyx p9 which is a granulated form um, of, of biochar based fertilizer and this it, this is much more interesting because, as I mentioned, the labor challenge means that dealing with any kind of bulky substrate, so biochar is, is highly voluminous um, and, and bulky and requires more labor to apply. Whereas onyx is a beaded, granulated product and therefore is easier to apply by the handful rather than by the shovelful. Um, so this reduces your labor intensive, intensiveness. And it's also more dense, so we can fit 25 kilos in a bag, which means that it's, it's better for transport and, and we believe will be, will be suitable for export. So these are the three products that, that we produce and, and how we distribute them in, in Cambodia. We've been trying over the last two years, several models. We've tried exclusivity with one fertilizer company. We've tried um, farmer to farmer, peer, peer demo farms, all sorts of different strategies. And now what we have is um, a, a provincial network of distributors. Um, so you can see the green dots in Cambodia where we have our distribution networks. So we work with agricultural cooperatives often or um, provincial input suppliers who we have long-term contracts with, take off agreements. We provide those um, agricultural cooperatives and those, those, those distributors with training with resources, with materials, with marketing materials and so on, um, so that they can sell locally. They have a healthy margin because that is their business and that is built into our business model. Um, and, and this is, the, this is the, uh, the format, the best distribution strategy that we've come across so far. And we're also pioneering a women's super farmer network. Um, and this is, this is, you can see in the provinces where we have our women super farmers. And how this works is we will take, for example, Mrs. Long here, you know, one of our one of our provincial distributors. Mrs. Long obviously knows all of the women in her village and in her province, um, and they are in daily contact with farmers, or maybe they're the wives of farmers, or maybe they're farmers themselves. So, Miss, what we will do is go with Mrs. Long. Mrs. Long will gather the the, the farmers and the women who are interested in in making an extra buck in in her province. We will train those those women farmers in the benefits of biochar, in its different applications, um, in um, how, how the the yield impact that we, that we've had in different different crops, and those farmers will then go. Mrs. Long has the contract agreement with us, so Mrs. Long has stock in her warehouse, and the farmers will then go out. The super farmers will go out and sell the product, and for every uh, for every product that they sell, they'll then take the stock from Mrs. Long. We from Husk will give them an incentive directly. We'll pay them an incentive um, through Wing, which is which is Cambodia's um, you know major mobile money uh, operator, and um, and this is something that we're pioneering now. We're prototyping at this stage, but we really do believe this is something that that we could take to scale um, because what is most expensive for us and which will cripple the business if we don't sort it, if we don't have it correctly organized, is um, the cost of distribution. So obviously. Send, sending our sales team uh, to the provinces um, is, is highly costly. So having this capillarity with local women is, is, is very, um, very key. So how do we scale and where to scale? Um, as I mentioned, we've been two, two and a half years in Cambodia. And over the next 10 years, we would like to have three installations across Asia. And in Southeast Asia alone, we've identified these markets as particularly interesting given the size of the imports of organic fertilizer. So um, the, we've, we've um, seen that in, in Vietnam, we've, there is really quite a significant size market. And this is because obviously there are over almost 250,000 acres of organic agriculture, but also there is a high volume of organic fertilizers imported, which will increasingly be under threat with the situation that we've, that we've described before. However, Thailand and Laos are also significant markets for us. And so as we grow in Cambodia, we, we, we are, are ready to export to these markets and, and operate, the idea is to operate under a regional hub. So Cambodia serves um, the very local markets and then across Asia have two other um, regional hubs. So in terms of our impact, um, over the last two and a half years, we've been measuring the impact on livelihoods, largely through the impact of yield. Um, so we understand that if we increase the farmer's yield, uh, the farmer will have higher revenue. And as long as we make the, the product affordable, 
uh, we will be able to um, have a break even point and a return on a positive return on investment for the farmer. So we've done over 250 trials on different crops and the average yield increase is 30% across, our, across the, the range of different horticulture crops that we've tried this on and the different locations and so on. This graph shows you with biochar, just with one application at one kilo per meter squared, over a period of two years, that's six crop cycles for short vegetable crops, we will, we've had a, a sustained increase in yield compared to the control. So that means, you know, we've got a, up to almost 80% increase in yield on the first application, but by the last application, we're still getting an increase in yield compared to the, to the baseline um, traditional practice. So that is the biochar. In the case of the, um, the livelihoods, we've mapped at what does that mean once you take into consideration the cost of the, of the product. Obviously, this depends on the value of your crop. So the higher value crop, the, uh, the higher return on investment for farmers, um, which is why we're focusing on horticulture and fruit and nut um, crops, because that's where the farmers can make make the most uh, the most money from from using this product. And here are some case studies that I'll just show you very quickly, but they'll be on the website so you can um, you can access them later if of interest. But in terms of kale, um, so Sokun had an 80% yield increase, which which we would have estimated this, these are through some of our trials, would have given a $7,000 income improvement, 50% um, improvement over his traditional method and therefore a return on investment of, of 1.89. Um, so that's, uh, that's the, the, the kale. Lettuce um, here, this, as you see, this is a lower value crop. Um, so not, not such a high return on investment, um, however, still significant um, and still uh, a, yield, a yield improvement. In the case of cucumber, um, again, interesting yield increase over 20% yield increase, which, which is an absolute revenue increase of, of 1,500 and 13% um, compared, compared to the traditional method. Um, with Onyx, uh, we actually are expecting significantly higher yield increases because the Onyx blends um, one of our byproducts from the, uh, from the pyrolysis, which is wood vinegar and, um, and the biochar and other nutrients and that is known to be uh, highly useful for root germination and resulting also in, in high yield increases. So our prototypes of the Onyx, we, we had an average of 44% yield increase. Um, and, I wish, and, and in some cases, you know, that went up to 200 and in other cases, um, not quite as much, but, but the average was 44. And here we can have some, here's some more data on, on melons. Um, and also in, in, there are other, other benefits, not just yield increase, but there is more resistance to pathogens, uh, less less insects, and sweeter fruits. Some have some have claimed that the fruit tastes better, um, or greener leaves. You can see the comments below from the farmers. So we've done a lot of a lot of case studies, um, soil moisture, um, larger cabbages. So you know, I think the, the the story is fairly clear. There's some science behind the the combination of of wood vinegar and biochar. And, and this is partly why our, our Onyx P9, we think is, is going to be a really powerful product. Um, the social benefits, just to, just to sort of conclude, are that we are providing an affordable organic input. Um, so we have, we have put our price point to match the existing um, organic fertilizers. And two years ago, we were significantly more expensive than synth synthetic fertilizers, but we were competitive with other organic fertilizers. Now that has massively changed and synthetic fertilizers are really increasing in price. So actually the switch um, from synthetic to a natural product is, is, is not, not, not so significant for farmers. And given that the, the longevity of the biochar, um, we are again, noticing a lot of farmers switching over uh, to organic. And in the case of those that are already, already using an organic product, there is no switching. It's just sort of transferring one product that is one organic fertilizer to another product, which has the added benefit of long-term soil improvement. So we're really operating in the organic fertilizer market. Um, the environmental benefits, obviously we're regenerating the soil um, in the long-term, enhancing the soil biome, 
but also re reduction in chemical pesticides and fertilizers given the less leaching because the, the water has the soil has the capacity to hold on to these to these fertilizers and long-term carbon sequestration so carbon is is important for us you know i've worked in the field of uh, climate change um, for the last 20 years and my personal ambition has always been to really do something at scale in terms of carbon removal. So for every uh, ton of biochar that we produce, we remove 1.34 tons of carbon from the atmosphere. Um, and we are certified by the European Biochar Certificates Carbon Removal C-Sync Certificate, which means that we can trade uh, carbon removal credits on the voluntary market. And this helps this income, which is only 10% of our income over, over time, does help to, to make our products affordable for farmers and effectively carbon credits pay for the carbon in our carbon-based fertilizers. And without that, we wouldn't be able to achieve the affordability. Um, just, a, just an aside on the carbon removal, there are lots of carbon removal options for which you can sell credits. And Biochar has this sweet spot of um, price and permanence. So we are, we are around between $100 and $200 uh, a ton for our credits. Um, and we stay in the soil for 100 years. Obviously, carbon capture and storage, DAX, and enhanced weathering state, the carbon stays in the soil for longer. However, these are more expensive solutions, $400 to $600 a ton. Um, and they actually take longer to, um, to sequester, to, to get up and running. Whereas you could finance a biochar plant today, and within 12 months, you've got it up and running, and you've got the carbon back in the soil. So it's very quick value to, uh, sorry, time to, to value, as opposed to the other the other options and then of course trees i mean trees are fantastic and and tree planting is obviously the most extensive carbon removal option however the tree will take around 50 years before it's actually um, sequestering the carbon that we need so so biochar has been recognized by the ipcc as one of the most viable scalable um carbon removal technologies and we feel we you know we've discovered a, a way of, of scaling that so what we've done so far is we have managed to regenerate 200, almost 250 hectares of soil calculated on our application rates in Cambodia. We've sequestered 522 tons of carbon um, and we estimate we've improved the livelihoods of 345 um, farming families. However, where we'd like to go is to get a million tons of carbon back in the soil. And to do that, we would need 10 Cambodias um, over 20 years. So we feel that we've proven the concept in Cambodia, we are ready to scale. And now what we're looking for is, um, is finance to upgrade our technology in Cambodia to uh, have a much more robust and larger uh, production volume to reduce our production costs, which will enable us to be um, more affordable for, for smallholder farmers and, and then to replicate that model across, across um, Asia. We have identified, we've done about three years of due diligence on different pyrolysis manufacturers, and we've identified uh, the, the technology partner with whom we want to scale. They're an Australian company, um, and, and we're really ready to, ready to go and, and currently seeking finance to do that. Um, and so with that finance, we, we are aiming within the first quarter of 2023 to significantly scale our production volumes to get to around 1,000 tonnes um, per year, which will be sequestering around 1,500 tons. And by the time we get to 3,000 tons of, um, of carbon-based fertilizers sold every year, that is when we reach the, the, the profitability and that is the replicable model. And 3,000 tons of fertilizer is um, less than 1% of the, of the Cambodian organic fertilizer market. And as you saw the volumes in Vietnam and elsewhere, this is really, really tiny. Um, so actually, we feel that this is um, this is highly doable. It's not a crazy um, hockey stick approach to business. This is uh, we think very very reasonable and conservative. Um, and the longer term picture is um, over the next ten years, we'd like to have three uh, operations in three global regions. So obviously, starting in Southeast Asia um, and then moving to the Mediterranean. We are we are our head office is based in Barcelona, so we are looking at Egypt as a um, as a, as the first country in the Mediterranean, and the COP will be held there later this year, so that's very timely for us. Um, and we, I guess, another just a comment to say over the over this period, 
Uh, we were awarded the Innovation Against Poverty Prize, which um, 10 companies around the world were awarded. And we've had endorsement from UNIDA and several other players, which, um, which we feel you know, helps, to, helps to show that what we're doing uh, makes, makes sense. In terms of the carbon, um, we would be able to sequester 80,000 um, tonnes of carbon over the over the um, the twelve year period. That's assuming each country is is only operating for ten years. But obviously, if each um, unit is is viable and sustainable, we wouldn't we wouldn't stop at ten years. We would carry on. And this is our production team in Cambodia, where um, where we have our production sites in in Kampong Tom. And these are all of the organisations that have helped us um, and supported us along the way. So. You know, we we have bootstrapped myself and co-founder Carol. Uh, we've bootstrapped the business um, during the first few years. We've won several prizes. We have um, been endorsed by several organisations and aid agencies. Um, and we have along the bottom here several partners who help us sell our carbon credits um, and organisations in, in Cambodia. I'm sure some of these you, you will recognise. But we would uh, we would love to add ADB's logo to this. Um, to this host of organizations that, that is helping us scale. And I'm very happy you know, to take questions and, and to follow up. I will stop, I know I've, I've run over time. I'm, I'm very sorry for that. But um, thank you very much for your time and listening and, and do please get in touch. Thanks, Eloise. Uh, I don't think you should apologize at all. It's fantastic. I, I, I've just been okay. furiously taking notes and your net, your net margin's 18%, which is pretty good. Um, just out of interest, how much money are you looking for? At the moment, uh, we're looking for two million, and that is to uh, effectively that breaks down into capex, which is around one million, which is to get new technology, new pyrolysis technology installed in in Cambodia, and then there's some ancillary cat ancillary. Um, so it's not just pyrolysis; it's also granulation and formulation. So yep. ancillary capex. And then we've got working capital um, and contingency to take us to that point where we reach the 3,000 tons of product sales, which is where we really are um, break even. So that's, that's what we're looking for. Um, and we, um, you know, at, at, that's at this point, once we get over that hurdle, we then will be looking for more money to be able to scale and replicate that, that, um, that model. Okay. Look, that's, that's fantastic. Um, we have a group called Ventures, which I'll refer this presentation off to, and I'll let them carry on the discussion with you. Um, what I'd like to do is find out if anybody has any questions, um, failing which I will ask you one. Uh, Saranja, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, a uh, very quick question. Uh, just what we want to know is uh, when this uh, bulk is applied there, do you explain the farmers about the application rates and uh, things like that? Or do you do a bit of a baseline study on the existing fertility of the soil before applying? I'm sorry, we did you could you hear that, Eloise? I couldn't hear it properly. I I think it's around the application rate. So there's also a message in the chat. I think with the with the same question. So is the question: Do we explain the application rate to the farmer? Yes, yes, that's the question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. Actually, um, because we are B2B, we explain the application rate to our distributors. So we, um, we do a lot of work building capacity with the distributors and the distributors tend to be agricultural cooperative leaders or input suppliers who are very familiar with application rates and different crops and so on. Um, so it's really the distributors that, um, whose capacity we build. But also we have on the packaging, you know, quite simply one kilo per meter squared is, is, is the application rate on, all, on the packaging of the biochar um, and the other products. And, and our understanding is if you put a, an application rate of one kilo per meter squared on your, on your packaging, farmers will use half that. that. That's the sort of practice because they'll want to save money. Um, so we build that into the application rates that we, that we put onto the, onto the packaging. Um, does that answer the question? Thank you, thank you. Srini, you had a question? Yes, I mean, it's not, uh, yeah, actually, it's a question come comment. 
thank you very much for the excellent presentation. And I know that uh, this is still uh, something that needs to be uh, sort of deployed at a wider scale to get the real benefits to our farmers. Actually, we have some program called GMS, uh, uh, Sustainable Agriculture and Food Security Program. Uh, this is a small technical assistance uh, supporting all the six countries. And one of the efforts is towards improving the soil health and uh, of course uh, biochar is one of the uh, key areas that we are looking at uh, in terms of improving soil health or soil resilience uh, to get all the advantages that you nicely presented uh, i just have two points uh, during your work i know you are in this presentation you are primarily focusing on utilizing the largest uh, waste available in this region which is rice husk I wanted to know whether uh, uh, during this process, have you also evaluated other feedstocks as a source for preparing biochar? The reason why we are asking is we are doing a, a demonstration and uh, uh, our colleague actually consulting team leader, Dr. Natsuda is also here in Thailand in non-province uh, where again, soils are degraded uh, we are also looking at uh, demonstrating this biochar uh, benefits. Uh, so from that angle, we want to know whether you have tested other feeds, I mean, other sources or other waste, agricultural waste as the feedstock for preparing the biochar. Secondly, uh, you referred to that you wanted to test this new pyrolysis technology. I mean, uh, because we are demonstrating this biochar, we are quite interested in testing. Of course, I mean, uh, uh, of course, we would like to know more about what that new pyrolysis technology is compared to what we already have. And if there is, if it's not confidential, maybe you can also elaborate uh, how this new pyrolysis technology compares with the with the existing uh, technology. I'll stop there. Thank you again for your nice presentation. Okay, th thank you very much. And do please do please get in touch because Thailand, um, you know, maybe there is a collaboration that we that we can that we can get involved in. Um, so the we have looked at other feedstocks, um, and as I, you can make biochar. The simple question is: is you can make biochar pretty much from any any source of biomass. Um, but the key factors to consider one will be carbon content. So um, rice husk is actually, when we've made our biochar, we only have 50% carbon content. If you made biochar from wood, so woody waste, so if you have a forest management product and you have branches and so on, then you'll get about 80% carbon content. This is great for the biochar and produces a higher quality biochar. Um, so, so, you know, woody waste. Um, and then if you go to straw, uh, that might have less, less woody, less lignin in it. So you might have a lower... A lower carbon content. Um, that is one issue to consider. The other issue is is the size of the. So, and for example, um, bagasse uh, from sugarcane is is a very useful um, useful feedstock. However, because of its stringiness, it's very fibrous. You need to deploy energy to to chop it up to get it into small pieces, and that's energy intensive. So then your carbon balance will be sort of offset. So it's something you need to consider. But the third, and I think probably the most significant is the, the logistics cost. So if you want to use, for example, rice straw, which would make huge sense because of all the burning of the rice straw, um, you know, we would avoid that, that air pollution problem so, so critical across Asia. However, the cost of getting that straw off the field and to your pyrolysis plant is significant. And that's going to, as you see, the margins are very, you know, they are, they are tight. Um, and if you add another $200 per ton of, of transport costs, that might make it not viable as a business. Um, so we've looked at others. However, you know, we've decided to stick with rice husk because we've developed expertise over that in the last two and a half years. And really because of the logistics and, and the size. And uh, it also, a lot of feedstocks you have to dry first. So if it's too wet, you can't put it through the pyrolysis. And pyrolysis creates heat, so that is okay. You can use the heat uh, to dry, but you might want to use the heat for something else. So there are, there are quite a lot of factors to consider. Um, 
And in terms of your second um, question, I'm afraid I can't share um, at this point the, the details of the, of the provider. Um, however, I can say that, you know, there is, obviously you've got farm scale pyrolysis technologies available that can be downloaded off the internet and anyone can make. And then you have technology that's sort of a million, a million plus capex. There is very little in between. So it's very little to get a, get a biochar company going that range between sort of three and 600,000 um, is, is very challenging. And there aren't many players out there, which is why unfortunately I can't, I can't at this point share, I'm, I will be able to, I hope soon, but perhaps if you get in touch with me separately, um, I can, I can give more details on that. Yeah, thank you very much. That's Thanks, fine. Eloise. We actually know quite okay. a lot of those manufacturers anyway, Eloise, because yeah. they come and talk to us as well. Steve, Please I go ahead, Jenny. Uh, One more question. Uh, no, not a question. Just uh, I, I want to mention, I think maybe Steve already knows about this. We have a ADB Ventures. So if you are looking at this uh, new technology, uh, they, they, they may consider some support. Yeah, I think, I think you're right, Trini. I think we should be forwarding this straight off to that team after it gets loaded online. Um, does anyone else have any questions? Thanks, Trini. I appreciate your input, brother. Hi. Uh, hello. Please, go ahead. Who's this? Yes, uh, I'm uh, Nasuda. I just are uh, helping our project uh, in Nan. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for your interest as a presentation. I would like to know uh, how many kilogram uh, of the biochar that you put into uh, the paddock or for the agriculture area. And uh, do you need, or we, we would like to, to know or to investigate the soil property first. And also uh, why was that for the property of the biochar that we will put it in our agriculture area? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then um, another thing that I would like to be um, um, hearing for you, how we can encourage our farmer to do the biochar business. Okay. Two thank very, you so much. Two thank very you. good questions. Yeah. yeah. I'll leave it to you, Heloise. <laughs> thank okay. you. So the application rate for biochar is one kilo per meter squared. So that means 10 tons per hectare, um, oh, which, which is significant. This is just the biochar, but as I said, we have three products. So the carbon-based fertilizer, CBF, is half a kilo per meter squared. So that's 500 grams per, per meter squared. And then our granulated format, the Onyx P9, we mm. uh, will be 350 grams per meter squared because it's, it's uh, granulated and, and more dense. So, mm -hmm. so it depends on the product. So we're going from one kilo per meter squared down to 350 uh, grams per, per meter squared. And we are focusing on horticulture, which deals with meter squared, less not so much with hectares, um, not mm -hmm. extensive crops, because it is difficult to, to make this affordable um, for extensive crops like rice, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're focusing on the higher value crops, so vegetables, mm -hmm. horticulture, fruit, um, and in terms of the, uh, the properties of, of the biochar, um, we have 50% carbon. So the mm -hmm. actual, so one thing is the biochar and then obviously the carbon-based fertilizers, but the biochar per se has 50% carbon um, and a surface area of 100, 200 grams per, um, sorry, sorry, 200 meters squared per gram. Um, the pH is seven point six, mm -hmm. um, and then I can we can we can share more other details. But those are the key factors really for the biochar, mm -hmm. and then for the um, for the carbon based fertilizers, we have one of them has an, an NPK of one five one. So the others the other has um, the onyx the onyx P nine has a has a three three nine zero. So we are similar in NPK to other organic fertilizers. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, I think, and your last question about do we provide soil testing? I think mm -hmm. that was, the, we, we, we don't. Um, I think a lot of, uh, I think it would be great to be able to do that, um, to be able to test, um, test soils before 
before and after and we're very happy to to get involved with research projects that are that are doing mm. that but it's not currently something we do i mean for us you know to generate the impact to get the, to the million tons of carbon back in the soil we need a viable business to scale this and for us the the key indicator of is this working is that people is that we're sold out so we're sold <laughs> out of our stock and for us that means that it's working and the farmer is the one who knows and he wouldn't be buying or she wouldn't be buying the product if it didn't work so um so that's uh, that's our main sort of evidence i guess of of this working okay thank you so much great questions <laughs> thanks nasuda yeah. um chinga you had some comments uh about uh um uh about the the model and about the mm. uh community engagement side of it be interesting to hear your take and you want to pipe up Hi, thanks. Thanks, Steve. Actually, um, I, I just dropped my questions already in the chat box. Um, this was really mm. an amazing presentation. Heloise, thanks so much. Um, this, uh, for me, this isn't necessarily the first time I'm hearing about biochar. Um, I've actually like had field trips to places many, many years ago who, you know, when I first heard of it, it seemed like, oh, this is such a a miracle thing and you, you mentioned that this is like a thousand year <laughs> technology mm -hmm. actually that's uh, been around so and so a lot of my questions around really this um you know what you're working on right now really ha i have a lot of institutional questions like why don't these things really take off from before if they've been around for so long if distribution is a problem why why you know it's all this questions around institutions that might maybe give some insight into distri distribution, the distribution challenges that you're having, mm -hmm. and Natsuda's question about how do we get the farmers to use this? I mean, they've been using it. Why did they stop using it? And why are we trying to convince them to use it again? And so on and so forth. But anyway, that's like a bigger question. And so just my, the, the, the ones I want to, you know, maybe just focus on given the time is that uh, for your for your business model, because um, because the the title of this um, presentation was circular economy. And I don't mean mm -hmm. to be too literal about that. But I wonder, so you're, uh, you're, you're gathering the husk, you're being supplied husks, I assume by farmers around Cambodia and so I, that's that's my my guess and uh and so I was wondering do the same farmers then benefit from the biochar that comes from so they supply the husk and it goes through your processes you have the biochar do any of the farmers get to 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 sort of uh so feed that biochar back into their own lands is that part of the model and then the other one my question would be is there some kind of like i, I realize this I, I i totally agree that businesses you know the, the advantages of businesses really to scale things up have r d make them focus have standardization there those are really um I, I i i don't want to take away from that but i'm wondering like for instance if we're talking about the challenges of distribution and all that could there be let's say a parallel model that's part you are a social enterprise and maybe part of that social enterprise might be a technology transfer program or maybe there's a, it's about supplying the pyrolysis technology to the farmer and that could be the business and the farms and farmers themselves make the biochar anyway they it's something that they 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 they, they you know they can just pick up on on uh, um, on on things they would be familiar with historically, so those are more of uh, that's my two questions. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Yeah, there's there's a lot there, and I'm not sure how much we can fit in the two minutes remaining. But um, but the 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 first question um, is around the circularity. Uh, when we set out to do this, that's exactly what we 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 envisaged. We thought, well, we'll buy the husk from the farmers, we'll make the biochar, and then we'll give the 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 biochar back to the farmers or sell it, and you know we'll make a business out of that. The reality is, um, always more complex. Um, that is still that is still the dream, but how it works in reality is we buy the husk from the rice mill, so the mill buys the paddy from the farmer. Um, and then the and then the mill mills the the rice and then the husk builds up and piles up so we actually buy the husk from the mill not from the farmer um 
And we then process into biochar. And we've spent these last two years sort of understanding the production process and really trying to, to make that work. Um, we would like to then uh, sell that biochar back to rice farmers. But at the moment, when you, when you have small scale, the production is very expensive. And those margins, that, that flying brick that I was showing you, um, is based on a, a more robust technology where we bring down the production costs. The smaller technology, the higher the production costs. So where we are now, we don't have a product that would be affordable for rice farmers um, because it's just too expensive to make the biochar at, at this at this small scale. Um, so we would like to get to the stage where we can actually ensure the, the biochar goes back to the rice farmers, but that does require the investment that we seek to have a, a more um, cost-effective means of production. So, so that's the question around circularity. It's still the goal, but, um, but there are some challenges around, around making that work. Um, and then sort of related to your second question, in, you know, for us, our, our social impact is, is really about um, providing a product that has social and environmental benefits at an affordable price. So, so that farmers can really get these long-term benefits in terms of soil restoration, which is very much related to food security um, and livelihood improvement, as, as I've mentioned before, and making it um, affordable uh, because at the moment, it, you know, there, there, there aren't so, so many other options. Um, if we were to go into the business of um, technology transfer and small-scale biochar operations so that farmers could make their own biochar, we come back to this issue that unfortunately the milling industry means that farmers don't have access to the husk. The husk is centralized. So uh, they don't, in some small cases, there are some small mills we have seen and, and people could make, but they already make their own biochar. If they have their, their own rice husk, they already um, make the pile of biochar have with the metal pole and, and do that themselves. So there's not really any technology transfer needed if they have the husk. Um, if they don't have the husk, it's going to be too expensive for them to go to get the husk, bring it back and, and feed their, their small scale pyrolysis technology. But the main barrier to that model is that small scale um, is, is intensive on labor and farmers don't have access to labor because young people are, are flowing into the cities. So, so really what is needed, what, far, what the farmers need is, is a product that, that works and that reduces their labor costs. Uh, so that is why we've sort of chosen this route and, and the other, um, I guess the other social impact, you know, as we go forward is the carbon credits. What we see is a value is transferring those net zero companies that want to become net zero have a budget to offset their carbon. And through our model, we're able to ensure that that carbon uh, finance gets back to the farmer in the form of a subsidy on the product. So that's effectively how we are using the carbon finance. And I think with our, with our skills um, and, and experience and networks uh, in the carbon markets, this is a way that we can really add, add value to, to smallholder farmers who are, net, who are it's going to be challenging for them to access the carbon finance. And carbon finance is a really exciting, rapidly changing and evolving um, space. And I think we'll see far more initiatives in, in, as, as we go forward and hopefully we can uh, help lever that finance and mechanism so that the farmers can receive directly the the income and that enables them to put the carbon into the soil which for, which is the long-term um, climate resilience and livelihood improvement solution thanks Eloise thanks for the question thank you thank you Jingay. okay so on that note um, I wanted to say thank you to Eloise and wish you the best of luck I um, I think you could probably have a bit more ambition, but you'll need money to have more ambition. So we'll probably have to help try and figure out a way to help you solve that. So on that note, we're going to finish the recording and thank you very much.